Hello and welcome to Discover Parrots. My name is Florin and my mission is to discover the true nature of wild and companion parrots and share this knowledge with other parrot lovers. Today I'm at the Think Parrots Show 2018 talking with Rosemary Lowe, a world-renowned parrot expert and author of many parrot books. Rosemary Lowe, welcome to Discover Parrots. Thank you. You have a lifelong experience both in studying parrots in the wild and uh, keeping and breeding parrots. How this passion um, developed in your life and leading to you this extraordinary career? Well, from an early age I was interested in birds. In fact, I used to push around my pet duck in my doll's pram <laughs> when I was about five years old. <laughs> Um, but not until I was 12 and I bought the budgerigar um, did birds become a passion. Um, from budgerigars I progressed to other easy birds like cockatiels and so on. And then over the years um, gradually acquired the more demanding species. Yes. You actually had uh, a professional experience in breeding parrots at Laurel Park and later that's, at Palmyra. That's correct. I was curator of both those wonderful collections in the Canary Islands. And obviously, uh, Laurel Park has the uh, largest number of parrot species yes. in the world. So that was an unparalleled experience to work with so many different species. Were, were there when uh, the first Lears Macaw was patched or maybe uh, no, Spix Macaw? No, uh, that was <laughs> quite a few years after I left to go to Palmitos Park. Well, Palmitos Park had a particularly good uh, collection of Amazons and Lawyers and Lorikeets, uh, two groups that I've long had a great interest in. But most of those birds were actually in the breeding centre rather bit than being on exhibit in the park. But they were again um, a marvellous range of species to work with. Yeah, lorries and lorikeets are actually some birds which not many people breed uh, in, in captivity, but you did and you, you are breeding. And uh, actually yeah. your latest book, I think, it's about lorries and lorikeets and their breeding. That, that's correct. Um, yes, it is called lorries and lorikeets. 45 years experience. Well, I've had 47 years keeping them now, and I love the colour, the personality. They're so active and lively, wonderful, wonderful birds. Unfortunately, a lot of people take them up, but they find them a bit too demanding with the dart and the cleaning. Although, actually, the dart is not that difficult, but you do have to be prepared to put in a lot of time with cleaning, but but they're well worth the effort. They are such beautiful, intelligent and lively birds. Are these your favourite species of parrot? Well, my very favourite species of all the parrots is Pesky's parrot, the big red and black parrot from New Guinea, which yes. is totally unlike any other parrot. Extraordinary bird. I had the good luck to work with breeding pairs at uh, Laurel Park and at Palmitos Park and I just have the most wonderful memories especially of young that I hand reared they were incomparable I just love those birds yeah well speaking of hand rearing it, this is kind of the standard today in, in agriculture my, my birds are hand reared you know hand reared chicks and the practice is kind of like People remove the chicks early in the nest and hand rear them. What's your opinion on this? Do you think it's maybe not the ideal? I think it's totally wrong. Yeah. I mean, I could wrap it on for hours about why. But I you're think not it's alone. Wrong. Other experts like Dragon and Dale say the same thing. I wanted to share. Um, uh, yeah. It has such a negative impact on their lives. One of the problems is that they show so many behavioural problems if they've been hand reared and that includes screaming because they're used to a lot of human attention and they can't amuse themselves so well usually as parent reared birds and 
um, they're, they're very, very demanding birds if they're hand reared. And they often cannot even identify themselves as birds. They're too closely bonded to people. And that really is a tragedy for the birds. Right, I can tell you how to avoid imprinting in hand reared birds. Uh, for, but unfortunately, most breeders want to sell them as soon as they can so they don't have these birds don't have the opportunity to socialize with their own species but if um, hand reared birds as soon as they are weaned are placed in accommodation with their own species or a closely related species and given a less human attention then they will um, learn the behaviour of their own species. And one thing that I did when I was at Palmitos Park, we had to hand rear Moluccan cockatoos because unfortunately the parents wouldn't rear them. And they are one of the worst species to imprint on people. And they have so many problems later in life if they're hand reared. I think it's totally wrong to hand rear that species. But what I did, we had a spare male Moluccan. So as soon as the young were about six weeks old, I would put them in a room with this male Moluccan who was free to fly in the room. And then they grew up with their own species from a very early age. And as soon as they were flying, they were flying in the room with this male Moluccan. And he loved, he loved that. Yeah, you know. So this alleviates so, the problem of imprinting yeah. because it gives them a model, a true model, like for their, their identity as a bird, as a Moluccan cockatoo in this case. So exactly. it's, it's this kind of. Yeah, but then that commercially, this is not viable, right? It, it's today. not. It's not viable, and well, it, it is viable if you're a conscientious breeder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but what I don't like is when people hand rear species such as rosellas and kakarikis which are not really pet bird material mm. and they hand rear them so that because they're an inexpensive bird they can then get a higher price for them that is totally totally wrong they're not thinking of the future of birds species like that which do not usually make good pets they're going to be passed on when they start to get aggressive or um, yeah, or had some of other their behavioral mate, problem. you know, human mate. And yes. I know from yeah. personal experience, my bird loves me and hates everybody else. So, mm. but what about um, these birds becoming potential um, breeder birds? Are they capable of reproducing oh, after yes. this kind of thing? Yeah, if, if they're socialized, as I said, uh, with their own species or very similar species, with minimal human contact then they learn the correct behavior and they can be used for breeding without any doubt. Obviously some hand reared birds are used for breeding but you can have very serious problems such as white cockatoos, they don't identify that species, they will kill the yeah. female. And, and this is, is this one of the reasons why you don't think captive breeding is great for conservation just to go to the next uh, question well let, uh, let's, let's be practical about it so often you read that captive breeding is a form of conservation well there are very very rare cases and i'll tell you what they are yes and they only occur in the uh, country of origin uh, a couple of examples are the Central American form of the scarlet macaw, which is almost extinct in Central America, yes. but there are, in about four countries in Central America, there are now captive breeding programs, and they are releasing the captive bred birds into the wild. Costa Rica is the best known example, but there yes. are other examples, because they were virtually trapped to extinction. So. Um, in some countries, captive very, very few occasions. And usually, such as the case of the Puerto Rican Amazon, 
they are tied up with uh, government programs. Um, by the obviously the Puerto Rican power is a very sad case after the hurricane. But even there, very large numbers have been released into the wild. But certainly until they had the second location in Rio Abajo, it was a waste of time because in the original site where they released them, the habitat was so poor that they couldn't survive. So um, there's another example. I mean, the Kakapo has benefited enormously because they take the eggs and um, hatch them in captivity. Then they are released on islands, cleared of predators. It almost isn't uh, the wild because it, it's, it's a very big, big aviary. Controlled. But Island size on the aviary. other hand, without that knowledge of how to rear these birds, yeah. um, then that would never have occurred. But right. I want to emphasize that it is a myth that captive breeding contributes to the conservation of parrots. I wish it were true, but it is. So we can't just expect to raise parrots in, the, in captivity and then release yes, them into the wild. It's, yeah, not, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's, it's very, very difficult. It, yeah, it's expensive as well. But it's not even true that captive breeding reduces the number of birds taken out of the I wanted to ask world. about this, yes. Because, okay, we in Europe don't have wild-caught birds anymore, so what does that mean? It means that countries like China and yes. so on, they take the birds that used to come to Europe and the numbers that are trapped uh, from the wild Unfortunately, it's very sad, but it's still high. But some people do believe this. I mean, there are these um, South African breeders, they have huge facilities like African grey parrot farms. They produce thousands of parrots. They say they will flood the market with these um, hand-raised chicks, send them to Asia, and they will supply the demand, and then this, the demand for the wild-caught birds in the jungle will Unfortunately, diminish. it doesn't work like I that. I wanted to hear your opinion on this. <laughs> because the, the people who trap them, um, well, it's mainly the middlemen who are making the money. Yes. And the fact that there are, they are uh, the, these wild-caught birds are a lot cheaper than captive bred birds anyway, yes. which is the first consideration, unfortunately, of many people who buy power. So even that doesn't work. And also, there is a lot of laundering of wild caught parrots as captive bred on the site certificates for endangered species. They, you will see C indicating captive bred, which is false. There are wild caught birds yeah. laundered as captive bred. So yeah. it's a very complex and difficult situation but unfortunately all adds up to the fact that captive breeding is not assisting yeah. conservation of wild parrots. But we can do a lot for our pet parrots in the houses, oh, right? Absolutely. I mean, reading your books, it's like you put together these two worlds, uh, like the, the, the wild, uh, wild birds and captive birds and all this knowledge comes together in your books and shows how to see the needs of the birds from its own perspective and how to apply this for giving it a flourishing life and maybe you could just give us a few examples of things we can do to provide a good life to our captive well, parrots. you know, when I'm watching parrots in the wild and I have been fortunate to watch them in 28 countries, one of the things that interests me most is what they are eating. And you find that they're often they're not eating the things that you would expect and they're feeding a lot on introduced species and some of these things they're feeding on you know are growing in in our own back gardens yes. probably so i would translate that to say we've got to provide much more variety especially in fresh growing foods um there are so many things every day i go out collecting things it's a bit time consuming but it's very easy yes. and they appreciate fresh things okay um, when hawthorn berries are in season 
That's a wonderful, wonderful food. Plus it's and enriching, right, for the, the behavior. Enriching, it is so enriching. You can put branches of hawthorn and there, and there will be nothing left. They will eat the leaves, the berries, the bark. It's all gone. But even, you know, in the spring before the berries, if you give them branches with young tender leaves, they love that. But uh, another thing is the number of parrot species that feed on flowers and I'm not talking about just small birds from macaws down to parrotlets so many parrot species feed on flowers in the wild which people don't realize uh, for example I grow a lot of nasturtiums yes because the flowers are fantastic what part just sells them here so <laughs> I just see them yeah. yeah and I mean lots of people put them in their own salads these exactly days. Yeah. but um, even if they don't eat them to start with, they will play with them and even the colours, you know, add some form of enjoyment to their life. Yes. But there are lots of flowers, um, lots of flowers that we grow, roses, well, mo a lot of them I think are double, they're yes. double varieties, so they have no pollen or nectar, yeah. yes. so you have to, I get wild roses from, from the hedgerows. On the subject of conservation, may I just mention my next please. book, yes, which will be please. published in July 2019, and it's called Parrot Conservation, A View Across Four Decades. Wow. So it covers just about every aspect of conservation of parrots, including my own experiences in visiting some of the parrot conservation projects which is a vast world. experience I know from your previous books. So um, thank you so much Rosemary Law for offering me this interview. Um, I hope I'll be here next year to read your book <laughs> and uh, uh, good luck with this presentation. I'll be here to record your lecture. So thank you very much. Goodbye. Well thank you and it's been a pleasure. <laughs> we force our birds to live in a house and uh, we have to remember that this is quite a challenging thing for them. Parrots are among the most playful of all birds and we should give them the opportunity to play.